Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Anna Gelpern, and I am a fellow here at the Peterson Institute and a law professor at Georgetown. Um, it is my huge pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome Michael Barr, a few words about him in a moment, to uh, Peterson and uh, to talk about a very timely cutting edge um, topic of broad interest. Um, this is the start of an exciting spring program. The cherry blossoms are coming, um, and so is the global economy. Um, on March 23rd and 24th, um, here at Pearson, we'll be convening economists and policymakers, some of whom are surely economists, um, to discuss the evolution of the international monetary system and the dollar's dominance um, and the role of exchange rate regimes in shaping the world economy. Um, then on March 28th, we will release the Institute's Global Economic Prospects. Um, this is our semi-annual outlook for the U.S. and global economies. Um, so if you want to know what the prospects are, tune in on March 28th. And then, of course, uh, April 10th, 14th, after the cherry blossoms, in the lead-up to the IMF World Bank spring meetings, um, uh, PIE will host our annual macro week um, with uh, central bankers and finance officials from around the world. Um, but first, we have central bankers and finance officials uh, right here, right now. Um, Michael Barr uh, took office as vice chair for supervision um, last summer in July. Um, he's also a member of the Board of Governors. Of course, and uh, prior to his appointment uh, to the board, uh, he had, he wasn't just vice chair, he had three chairs by my count. Um, he was the John and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy uh, at the University of Michigan, the Frank Murphy Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, also at Michigan, and the Roy F. and Jean Humphrey Prophet Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, he founded the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy um, in the uh, International Transactions Clinic and Detroit Neighborhood Entrepreneurs Project, which actually brings me to um, Michael's long commitment to um, the to uh, financial regulation, public service, uh, financial inclusion. I mean, some of the first um, stuff I've read about the Community Reinvestment Act, some of the most lucid and compelling, um, many, many, many moons ago, uh, was Michael's work. Um, also, the first uh, piece of work on the Basel Committee that I ever assigned to my students, again, back when dinosaurs walked the earth, was uh, Michael's piece that really uh, seriously considered the legitimacy and efficacy of the Basel process. He is, of course, right now the author of a textbook that um, many dozens of excited students um, watching this online, hello students, um, are uh, devouring um, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, now, um, he has, of course, had uh, prior tours of public service uh, at the U.S. Treasury. This is, uh, I think, your third, right, in the government. Uh, two tours at the Treasury and then now um, at the Fed, which is okay. Um, and, uh, and then if you count your Supreme Court clerkship, that's number four with uh, Justice Souter. Um, uh, Michael, it's a, my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to Peterson, and I look forward to hearing your insights on um, crypto, um, its grammatical and policy position. Um, thank you so much. Welcome, Michael. Thanks very much, Anna, and thanks to the uh, Peterson Institute for uh, having me here today. I'm really looking forward to uh, the conversation. Uh, I'm going to give some formal remarks and then we'll have a chance for uh, some Q&A. I'm here today to discuss what we have learned from the recent turmoil in the crypto sector and what role supervision and regulation should play in helping banks manage their engagement with the sector and the innovative technologies that support it. 
Despite recent events, we have not lost sight of the potential transformative effect that these technologies could have on our financial system. And we need to be careful lest regulation lock in the power of incumbents or stifle innovation. But the benefits of innovation can only be realized if appropriate guardrails are in place. I'm going to talk about how we're working to provide clarity to the banks we supervise about what we have learned and about our supervisory expectations. I'll wrap up by sharing some thoughts on stablecoins. It isn't hard to find evidence for the need to discuss crypto, but let me start with a recent personal experience. Last month, I visited the Mississippi Delta to talk about financial inclusion and community development. And I spent a morning talking with a group of college students. When I asked, it turned out that most of the students I met owned some crypto assets. This surprised me because in my experience as a professor, most college students are usually strapped for cash. What didn't surprise me is that many of those who said they owned crypto assets also said that they had lost money and they weren't very happy about that. It was a reminder to me that crypto assets aren't just held by people with ample money for speculation. A fifth of Americans, many of them with limited savings, say they have owned some form of crypto. The problems that have come to light in the crypto sector over the past year may have affected a large segment of the public. When I think about how to approach crypto assets, the technology behind them, and the interaction between the crypto sector and the traditional financial system, I find it helpful to place recent innovations in historical context. Innovation in financial markets has long raised questions about the appropriate role of regulation. Of particular concern is how the regulatory framework can serve both to encourage innovation and to support the safety and soundness of financial institutions and broader financial stability. Just as important is the need to protect the public from fraud and other abusive behavior. The challenge here begins with a mismatch in timing. Innovation often comes quickly, but it takes time for consumers to become aware that they could both gain and lose money on new financial products. It may take time for market participants to understand attendant risks and come up with tools to manage them. Likewise, regulation involves a deliberative process, as it should, because it needs to balance the risk that overregulation will stifle innovation with the risk that underregulation will allow for substantial harm to households and the financial system. Long before crypto became an issue for regulation and public policy, I was grappling with how to think about the cycle of innovation in the context of the global financial crisis. New products often develop slowly at first while market participants are unsure of their value or risks. But excitement and enthusiasm can then lead to rapid growth and new products flood the market as a result. Participants assume too quickly that they know how the new products work and novel products can appear both safe and lucrative, particularly if they have not been tested through bouts of market stress. The innovation cycle then turns when this mismatch between perceived understanding of risk and actual underlying risk becomes apparent. Back then, I was talking about some of the causes and consequences of the global financial crisis. At that time, new types of financial products had become so intertwined with the banking and broader financial system that the turn in the innovation cycle resulted in devastating consequences for homeowners, workers, businesses, and the economy. Today, while the crypto asset sector is more nascent and less pervasive, the questions about how new financial products will affect the public, the economy, and financial stability are similar. Innovation surges ahead and regulation follows, trying to balance benefits and risks. Before I get into how we're responding to developments in the crypto sector in our approach to supervision and regulation, I want to recognize the potential public benefits of the technologies underlying crypto assets. It is often argued that these technologies will have extensive beneficial application beyond the crypto assets themselves. The payment system is critical to everyday Americans. It is highly resilient, but also can be slow and expensive. This is particularly true with respect to cross-border payments. The technology underlying crypto assets, including that which enables programmability, could bring new functionality or efficiencies to payment systems. Proponents also claim that distributed ledger technology, encryption, and new ways of validating transactions 
could be used to facilitate faster reconciliation, clearing and settlement, and reduce costs for a variety of traditional asset transactions, including, for example, by linking securities and cash markets in ways that are more difficult to achieve under our current financial infrastructure. Use of smart contracts could automate certain actions, creating further efficiencies. Such use of the technology could lead to potential operational efficiencies and reduce costs. The Federal Reserve has dedicated considerable resources to exploring and understanding these technologies and their potential benefits, as well as the risks associated with these innovations. In contrast to the potential benefits of these technologies, there is the actual experience of the many people whose hope and enthusiasm for crypto assets have met with disappointment and sometimes devastating loss. Robert Schiller describes how Bitcoin is a prime example of what he calls a contagious economic narrative. The story of Bitcoin's value proposition taps into the fears of government control and with the promise that through superior technology, a new product can yield untold riches. But when it comes to certain crypto assets, some of which have no intrinsic value beyond the faith of their owners, the law of gravity will eventually apply, as it did with the tulip frenzy in Holland more than 400 years ago. Experience has shown that crypto assets can face the same fundamental liquidity and credit risks as traditional assets and can be highly correlated with other traditional risks rather than being hedges against such risks. While purveyors of crypto assets have represented to customers that they are protected through the decentralized nature of the underlying technology, customers are often at a greater risk because those purveyors find ways to function outside of a robust supervisory and regulatory system. In the absence of regulatory compliance, customers don't have the information they need to assess and mitigate their risks. Investors do not have the structural protections they have relied on for so many decades. As a result, many have been victims of classic cases of fraud and abuse, some appropriately classified as Ponzi schemes under a high-tech veneer. Moreover, while crypto assets are hyped as decentralized, there has been an emergence of new, quite centralized intermediaries that are either not subject to or not compliant with appropriate regulation and supervision which has perpetuated harm to consumers. Complicating matters further, these entities often seek out jurisdictions with loose or less developed legal and regulatory frameworks for financial activities. And the lack of consolidated home country supervision and coordination with host country supervisors rekindles the kind of abuses that bank regulators long ago quashed. While such cross-jurisdictional regulatory arbitrage is not new, the digital nature of these activities provides for a greater opportunity to expand the reach of such entities to customers around the world. For example, the prominent collapse of the FTX crypto asset trading platform has reportedly wiped out the holdings of a million people, costing them billions of dollars. Unfortunately, this is not the only example. Since last summer, we saw the collapse of one crypto intermediary after another. As these cases are working their way through the bankruptcy courts, we're seeing indications of misuse of client funds, misrepresentations, obfuscation about the availability of deposit insurance, and potential fraud. Crypto has also been implicated in numerous cases of illicit financing. Crypto assets pose significant money laundering and terrorist financing risks due to the synonymous actors that are parties to transactions, the ease and speed of transfer, and the general irrevocability of transactions, all of which make crypto assets attractive for use in money laundering and terrorist financing. Indeed, enforcement agencies, including the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and the Department of Justice, have taken numerous public enforcement actions against entities or individuals dealing in crypto assets. This kind of behavior can cause substantial harm to investors and consumers as well as our financial system. The federal bank regulatory agencies, including the Federal Reserve Board, have a statutory responsibility to ensure that the activity of the entities we supervise is conducted in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with all applicable laws. While the effects of the events in the crypto sector on Federal Reserve supervised banks have been limited 
in the aggregate thus far. Recent experience has made it clear that crypto could pose risk to those banks. In response, we have worked with the other federal bank regulatory agencies to provide clarity and guidance on what is permissible, safe and sound, and compliant with anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing laws, as well as consumer and investor protections. And we've set out our supervisory expectations for banks engaging with new product types and activities. As noted above, this is not just a domestic issue. We're also working with our international counterparts to minimize the possibility of regulatory arbitrage across jurisdictions. One overarching principle of the Federal Reserve's financial oversight is that activities that are fundamentally the same should be regulated the same, regardless of where or how the activity occurs or the terms used to describe the activity. We have, to say the least, a somewhat complicated financial services regulatory framework in the United States. And there are several regulatory authorities with oversight of financial services activities. But we know how important it is for entities interested in providing financial services with new technologies to engage on a level playing field. That is why we work closely with the other bank regulatory agencies to develop a consistent approach. Our overall stance is that at this stage of development, banks should take a careful and cautious approach to engaging in crypto asset related activities and the crypto sector. Over decades, federal bank regulators have articulated supervisory expectations for managing, monitoring, and controlling risks to safety and soundness. These expectations are generally principle-based, meaning they can be applied in a broad range of circumstances. Given emerging interest in crypto asset activities, we have worked to provide clear and transparent guidance. Last August, we published a supervisory guidance letter for activities uh, uh, for, for banks in considering engaging in crypto related activities. And one of the first steps is uh, to engage in a serious um, a, a conversation uh, with their regulators. In the first letter that we uh, published last August, a guidance letter for banks engaging these activities, we reminded firms that when considering engaging in crypto related activities, they need to establish that the activities are legally permissible and that there are sufficient controls in place to ensure these activities can be conducted in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with all applicable laws. Against the background of possible crimes that some crypto companies are now under investigation for, this is not a box checking exercise. Our letter also let banks know that they're expected to notify the Federal Reserve if they intend to engage in crypto asset related activities and to engage in a robust supervisory conversation. The letter said, in effect, don't jump in and plan to figure out risk management later. It stated that Federal Reserve supervised banking organizations should have adequate systems and controls in place to conduct crypto asset related activities in a safe and sound manner prior to commencing such activities. In the ensuing months, a lot has happened in the crypto world, including the turmoil I discussed earlier. On January 3rd, after learning from these developments, the board and other bank regulatory agencies issued another statement advising banks to be focused on a list of several key risks. The list ranges from the risk of fraud and scams of crypto participants to money laundering and terrorist financing to stablecoin run risk. Later in January, the board issued a policy statement making it clear to the banks we supervised that the board would apply the same permissibility standards to activities, including crypto asset related activities, regardless of a bank's deposit insurance status. The preamble to the statement made clear that we would likely view it as unsafe and unsound for banks to directly own crypto assets on their balance sheet. In addition, we clarified that the banks were supervised seeking to issue stable coins or dollar tokens would have to show that they have controls in place to do so in a safe and sound manner and that they would need to obtain a non-objection notice from Federal Reserve supervisors before proceeding. On February 23rd, we provided additional clarity about supervisory expectations through another statement issued jointly with the other bank regulatory agencies. This statement was also informed by recent supervisory experience. The statement highlighted to our supervised institutions that they need to be aware of the liquidity risks associated with certain crypto sector affiliated deposits. We always expect banks to assess and manage the liquidity risks of their funding sources. As the statement makes clear and has been obvious throughout the last few months, 
Crypto sector depositors may have assets that can be affected by volatility in the sector. This volatility can lead to unpredictable, rapid, and correlated deposit inflows and withdrawals. And thus, the liquidity risks of their deposits, of course, require additional attention. These liquidity concerns are particularly acute for banks that have a meaningful portion of their balance sheets funded with such deposits. Again, we took these steps to make clear that we have the same expectations for all the institutions that we supervise and which seek to engage in novel activities. These expectations are not new. We expect supervised entities to ensure that they conduct their activities in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with all relevant laws, including anti-money laundering laws. These public statements are transparent and provide the same information for everyone, including for small banks that may not have large teams of analysts assessing industry developments, large banks with more resources, and of course, the public. We plan to continue to publish guidance of this kind as we continue to examine activity in the sector. In addition to sharing what we learn with the public on an ongoing basis, we're also enhancing our supervision of these activities. We are creating a specialized team of experts that can help us learn from new developments and make sure we're up to date on innovation in the sector. I want to wrap up today by talking about stablecoins. As Chair Powell has said, stablecoins are a type of private money. And there's a long and messy history of private money in the United States that shows the need for robust regulation and oversight. Any entity issuing money denominated in the US dollar and drawing on the trust of the Federal Reserve needs to be subject to federal prudential regulation and supervision. I'm not saying anything new here. This has been our consistent approach. Stablecoin issuers seek to have, but don't, some of the same characteristics as federally insured bank deposits. Stablecoin issuers represent that their liabilities can be redeemed on demand at par, a dollar for a dollar. In fact, however, the assets backing the liability can fluctuate in value. Even if the assets backing the claim are high quality, they cannot necessarily be immediately monetized as we, <clears throat> and operational risks are quite high. As we have seen all too often, depositors sometimes want or need their money immediately, especially in times of stress. This mismatch, this mismatch in value and liquidity is the recipe for a classic bank run. Issuers are not supervised by the Fed and lack capital and liquidity as a backstop. The banks we regulate, in contrast, are well protected from bank runs through a robust array of supervisory requirements. Consider the consequences if a stablecoin not subject to appropriate supervision and regulation were to be adopted as a widespread means of payment, which some stablecoin developers state as a goal. Stablecoins have the potential to scale quickly because of network effects. An unregulated, unsupervised, deposit-like asset could create tremendous disruptions, not just for financial institutions, but for people who might rely on the coin if it were to get wide adoption. We must learn from the past to ensure that we do not allow for new forms of unregulated private money subject to classic forms of run risk and with the associated spillovers and systemic implications for households, businesses, and the broader economy. That gets me back to the central point of my remarks which is the need to balance innovation with safeguards. Our goal is to create guardrails while making room for innovation that can benefit consumers and the financial system more broadly. We're working with the other bank regulatory agencies to consider whether and how certain types of crypto asset activity can be conducted in a manner that is consistent with safe and sound banking. We are also working towards providing additional clarity in our views of the risks and effective risk management practices across a range of crypto-related activity. We will continue to be transparent with the banking sector and the public about our expectations. We will also work with the other agencies to align our approach to ensure that the same risks receive the same treatment. As we continue our efforts, we will work to support innovation by establishing the guardrails essential for sustainable, safe, and transparent markets. Thank you. might be the first time we have two lawyers or two people trained as lawyers <laughs> on stage so particularly delighted. we'll be very careful right 
Um, so Michael, thank you so much. Uh, you've given us an enormous amount to uh, think about. And I've been getting um, questions from my students all along. So I suspect that this has uh, stimulated a lot of uh, thinking along the way. Um, I wanted to start with a um, big-ish picture question that does come from one of my students. And that is, uh, would it be fair to think of this period as um, analogous to crypto's Dodd-Frank moment, right? Or um, uh, sort of have the recent events that um, certainly inform your remarks um, clarified the path forward, not just for you and your colleagues, but more broadly. Um, and you should know about Dodd-Frank having uh, played rather an active role in that, as you suggested. Um, I, I do think this is a really critical moment um, for us and for the public and for Congress to stay, uh, take a step back and look at the risks and benefits of crypto asset related activity broadly. Uh, we uh, have just gone through an experience that uh, you know, did not cause enormous disruption to our broader economy, uh, but was uh, quite disruptive to the crypto asset sector and in a way that revealed um, some of the problems that people had been highlighting about the sector for a long time, the, the lack of transparency, the fact that many entities engaged in this activity actively sought to avoid uh, being supervised or regulated, the problem of fraud, uh, misuse of customer funds, uh, some of the um, hype associated with, uh, with uh, stable coins and with crypto asset uh, activities more broadly sort of revealed. And, and so it, it's an appropriate uh, time to step back and look at those risks. And then I do think we need to come in and establish an appropriate framework uh, for regulating that activity. Uh, we're, we're focused at, at the Federal Reserve and with my sister uh, agency, banking agencies at using our existing authorities uh, with respect to the safety and soundness and compliance of the banking system. Uh, but obviously there's a set of activity going on that is mostly not in the banking sector, uh, it is mostly um, outside the banking sector. And, other, other market uh, regulators in Congress need to think about you know, the appropriate uh, role for regulation of those entities. And as I mentioned at the end of my remarks, I think there's a, a critical role for Congress to play right now in establishing a framework for stable coins uh, because uh, stable coins in particular um, pose uh, the potential for systemic risk if they're not uh, regulated appropriately, if we don't have strong federal prudential supervision and oversight of stable coins. They do have this ability because of network effects to scale quickly. And they are a form of private money that borrows the trust of the central bank. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely critical that we get the regulatory oversight of that right. Uh, so yet again, this gives rise to a whole bunch of fascinating questions, I'm sure for um, our audience, but also for me. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you mentioned um, the uh, financial stability risk, particularly from stable coins and, uh, you know, kind of the world that uh, uh, we both occupied on occasion. I, I'm reminded on the one hand of money market funds, on the other hand of currency boards, mm -hmm. right? And so um, there are a few ways to think about this. Um, you can draw regulatory perimeters right, and say, look, we're going to oversee everything inside and we feel okay about what's happening outside, either because somebody else is taking care of it or because it's not worrisome. Um, but then there is, uh, you know, and I would love for you to elaborate a little bit on kind of perimeter drawing in the space, not just I, absolutely for stable coins, but also beyond that and sort of the grammatical uncertainty of what crypto might you know, is it an adjective or is it a noun? Um, <laughs> I think it stands for a deeper classification problem, honestly. Um, but then there's another dimension and we might follow up on that. And that is both you and Chair Powell characterized uh, stable coins as, pri as private money. Well, one way to deal with private money is public money. Um, so um, kind of your position on, you know, 
public digital currency um, in the US and beyond, I think would be really interesting to um, tease out in relation to the concerns about stable coins. Well, let me, uh, let me try and I, I think we've got maybe three categories of questions. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the first category, it's really a question about, you know, what's inside and outside the regulatory perimeter. And as you and your students know, because you're in the middle of this now, that is a, a pervasive question in banking regulation um, and has been throughout, um, you know, throughout our history. And there's always going to be some set of activities that um, happen outside of whatever line you draw. And then the question is, you know, how comfortable do you feel about that activity being outside the perimeter and, um, and how should it be regulated if, if it's not? Uh, you know, my view is not, not everything has to be in the banking system. Uh -huh. It's fine for there to be market activities that, that occur outside of banks, outside of prudential supervision. We still need for those kinds of activities, uh, you know, strong rules of the road. You know, one of the reasons that we have uh, the most, you know, effective and innovative and efficient uh, capital markets in the world is because we have really good strict laws um, that enforce investor protection, that enforce transparency, that enforce uh, segregation of client assets, that have rules about what kinds of entity can do what functions, that separate functions where there might be uh, serious conflicts of interest. And so those rules have created, I think, one of the most you know, vibrant and efficient uh, markets in the world, the crypto sector is trying to operate without those rules. And I, I think that that's, you know, that's a significant, uh, significant risk. With respect to stable coins, it's in addition to the kinds of market risk that, that I described, there's a, a serious prudential risk, which is that you have an unregulated, unsupervised uh, form of private money that then gains traction because of network effects. And um, uh, and then once people are used to using it, uh, collapses because it doesn't have the appropriate uh, controls. And you know, if you think about various periods in our uh, U.S. history, you know, if you think about the period before the uh, the controller of the currencies office was established and before national banknotes um, were issued in the Civil War, uh, we had uh, lots of private money. Private banknotes were used. Um, we had um, institutions uh, uh, offering, you know, individual notes that people then had to go negotiate with each other about what they were really worth. Is it really worth a uh, dollar if it says it's worth a dollar or, you know, because it's hard to trade in, you know, is it worth less? And, and that was highly inefficient. And one of the really important innovations um, coming out of the Civil War from a financial perspective was the idea that we had one unit of account. Uh, one currency, and uh, that that is uh, a much more efficient way to run an economy, and and more importantly, a much more financially stable way to run an economy. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can have multiple competing forms of private money that are that are inefficient. You can have very large forms of private money that end up uh, being quite uh, destabilizing. Uh, you know, you can think of a. Uh, a stablecoin is a completely unregulated money market fund attached to a payments rail, uh, and and that combination is quite you know is quite explosive, quite potentially quite dangerous, and that's why Chair Powell has made this clear. Vice Chair Brainerd, when she was uh, at the Fed, made this clear. I've made it clear that uh, stablecoins really do need to have prudential oversight, prudential supervision, um, uh, because of that risk. It, it did take several national banking acts and, and some decades and some incentives for the Fed dealing with access to the payment system to actually get that banknote mm -hmm. chaos under control, right? Yeah. So that hopefully we're not talking for decades. Well, you know, one of the nice things about, um, you know, having the lessons of history is that we don't have to recreate the problems all over again that we've already solved. And so I think it's important that we learn from that history and, and act appropriately and expeditiously. And going back though to payment systems in particular and to the um, 
to the coin piece of stable coin. Um, do you view this debate as at all related to the central bank digital currency conversation in the United States or not so much? Um, I, I think of them as, uh, as swimming in separate lanes. Okay. Um, so we need to have, uh, if people want to issue stable coins, we need to have strong prudential oversight uh, of, of that activity. Uh, over the people, over the issuance, over the wallets, um, over the structure of the mechanism for the mm -hmm. transfer, the, the, uh, the um, uh, whatever the uh, effect of blockchain is or other mechanism underlying the stable coin. So all that needs to be supervised and regulated. Um, there's a separate question, which is, you know, should, uh, should the Federal Reserve issue a, a central bank digital currency? And people might want that for lots of different reasons than they want a stable coin. Uh, I think they're functionally quite different instruments. And so we think of them just as um, uh, separate, separate sets of issues to work on. At the Fed, we're very focused right now on research and development um, about central bank digital currency. We haven't made any decision about whether we think it's a good idea. Uh, and uh, we've made it clear that if we move forward uh, on a central bank digital currency, uh, we would ask Congress and, and the administration for their views, and we'd want to do it only if there was a consensus that this, this was something that was good for the country. Now, speaking of consensus, um, and going back to your point about financial stability, um, to what extent, um, what, what do you see as the role of the Financial Stability Oversight Council in this conversation? And I mentioned this both because you mentioned um, regulators who are not federal bank regulators, or of course, NEAT as part of uh, FSOC, and also the financial stability dimension of it, um, and just hashing out a shared position on what legislation should be in this space. We do, we do spend a lot of time in the Financial Stability Oversight Council meetings um, talking about uh, issues uh, related to uh, crypto asset development and including stable coins. So uh, it is a forum for conversation, it is a forum for consensus building. As you mentioned, the, uh, the SEC and CFTC, in addition to the federal banking agencies, are part of that. We have state regulators um, as part of the FSOC. And so it is a, a really good forum for discussion of these issues and, and of uh, exchange of views on these issues. Um, two more quick questions, and then I'd like to open this uh, for uh, audience questions. So one is um, really going to your latest guidance, mm -hmm. right? And it seems to be, and this whole idea of crypto-related activities, I mean, we're all crypto-related, you know? <laughs> To some degree, um, and uh, so, if, for example, a, the business model of an institution, right, is tied in uh, on either side of the balance sheet with the crypto sector, but really with the tulip sector or with the auto sector, right, isn't that a sort of concentrated funding business model problem and isn't that something that should have been picked up earlier in just your good old supervisory um, uh, work and I, which leads me to the broader question of um, when you talk about guardrails um, are we talking about um, guidance about existing guardrails um, as adapted to this space? Um, or are there new guardrails that are, you know, sort of what's the mix of old and new in the guardrail building space? But first, just the, how much of this can be handled with traditional supervision? Um, you know, our perspective to date has been quite a lot can be handled with traditional supervision and regulation. The, the kind of guidance that we're issuing is kind of motherhood and apple pie guidance. Um, banks should be aware of all the risks they face and take into account those risks and put in place appropriate risk controls. Banks should follow anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist laws. Um, these are pretty basic building blocks of supervision and regulation. Don't they kind of know that already? Banks that have concentrated risks should uh, uh, 
uh, you know, conduct themselves with knowledge of those concentrated risks. I think what we've seen with some of the smaller institutions that have gotten involved in um, providing traditional banking services to crypto-related companies is that the uh, extent to which they are exposed to correlated risks uh, was not well understood. Mm -hmm. And I think what we uh, saw with the, you know, what people call the crypto winter um, is that risks in the crypto sector are highly correlated. And so if you have deposits from crypto related entities, it's highly likely that those entities will suffer stresses in similar ways at the same time. And those stresses might cause wild swings, inflows into deposits and outflows um, of deposits. And, and the experience of smaller institutions is that they have actually experienced that. Uh, and those liquidity risks are, are really meaningful. And so in our latest guidance, we highlighted to banks the importance of taking that seriously. Shouldn't somebody have picked that up? I'm sorry. Shouldn't somebody have picked that up? Uh... Yeah, I do, think, I, I do think if you look at the um, range, particularly of smaller institutions that were involved, we, we tend to have a, um, a very, uh, I would say, light touch approach to smaller institutions. And so there's more of a, an impetus on them to actually be paying attention to these new and novel risks. And uh, we, we need to make sure that they, they understand them. There are obviously larger institutions that are exposed to these risks too, but the exposure tends to be a very, very small part of their balance sheet. And so even if they experience the same deposit outflows, they're more insulated because of the diversification of their balance sheet from the kinds of exposures that they see. And firms of all sizes, whether it's a small bank or a large bank, uh, are exposed to the potential problems associated with some of the illicit financing activity that's uh, uh, been happening in the crypto uh, space. And the need for heightened controls in that space, I think, is is quite acute. Uh, and uh, so it just it calls out for again heightened risk management, but within the framework that we have, which I think is a, an appropriate framework for for dealing with these issues. Well, thank you so much, and I'm deeply tempted to ask about Basel, but I won't. Um, uh, I unfortunately we cannot take questions from the. Uh, audience online, which is uh, rather large, as my phone tells me. Um, but um, if uh, anyone in the audience here has a question, if you could come up to the microphone, um, state your name, affiliation, and a question question. Um, microphone? So uh, I'm, yeah, maybe I should repeat for the online audience, uh, Nicolas Veron at the Institute. So this policy discussion doesn't uh, take place in an international vacuum. I'm particularly interested in your uh, views on uh, initiatives that have already taken place in other jurisdictions. I'm thinking in particular of the MICA market in crypto asset uh, regulation in the European Union, whether they're a source of uh, ideas and um, comparison points for the U.S. policy process are basically, you know, too different to apply to the specificities of the U.S. Uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Uh, the the um, uh, If you look around the world, many countries, many jurisdictions around the world are uh, more advanced in their regulatory frameworks than we are here in the United States with respect to how to regulate uh, crypto-related activities. Uh, the Europeans uh, have a comprehensive framework uh, that's coming into place. Uh, the Japanese have a comprehensive framework. But many countries around the world have developed uh, an approach to this sector. Uh, traditionally, uh, in the United States, it's hard for us to come up with those types of regulatory moments. And we have an existing uh, regulatory infrastructure that can be um, adapted to new products and services. Uh, and that, that is usually the way the United States ends up moving forward with regulating a new, a new kind of product is to say, 
uh, is this new kind of product like an existing product that we develop? And in what ways can we therefore um, regulate it using our existing tools? And in the absence of Congress adapting a, a different framework, that's the framework we use. So when we think about, um, uh, in the banking sector, when we think about regulating crypto-related activities, we don't think, um, uh, you know, aha, we now have um, uh, a new type of orange. Um, we need to have new orange regulation. We say, this new orange looks a lot like the oranges that we already eat. Um, and so we think about how to regulate it in that light and, and modify our rules for any um, different kinds of risks that are posed by the activity. And in the, again, in the absence of uh, a Congress stepping in with comprehensive regulation, I think that's the approach you'll you know, continue to see uh, here in the United States. Expanding on that very briefly, so how relevant is uh, the Basel process and FSB at the moment, right? They have both uh, sort of provisionally said things in this space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it relevant? Is it, um, I mean, going back to your earlier work, does it frame what we do or do we just sort of watch it out of the corner of our eye and see if it's okay? No, we're, we're, we are active participants in the Financial Stability Board um, and in, um, in helping to shape the global framework. Uh, so it is reflective in many ways of our views about how to think about these risks. Um, the actions we're taking uh, in the US with respect to regulation of banks engaged in this sector are consistent with the principles that the uh, Financial Stability Board has articulated. Uh, with respect to the Basel process, the, the Basel process has resulted, for example, in a, a framework for capital treatment of uh, crypto-related uh, activities. And, and that, that would also be consistent with our, our thinking about uh, the approach in this area. We don't currently, to our knowledge, have any firms that we regulate that have um, crypto on the balance sheet. And we've made it clear to firms that we don't think that they should. Uh, we don't think it's in our our current environment, our current state of governance and controls in the crypto sector. We don't believe that it would be a safe and sound practice for them to do so. Um, so we don't yet have the question of how much capital they should hold if they if they have it. Uh, but but those those larger frames are consistent with how we're thinking about uh, risks in this area. And your bank holding company approach and your approach to foreign bank entry and intermediate holding companies. I mean, it's sort of all on the doorstep, right? right. Um, Steve, please. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Kamen from the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, uh, very nice speech, uh, Vice Chair Barr. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, I was uh, intrigued by your uh, comments that um, uh, stable coins and central bank digital currencies or CBDCs were being treated in some sense sort of separately, uh, you know, uh, by the board's uh, considerations. And considering that they're both digital uh, currencies and considering that issuance of a CBDC could in principle compete with or even wipe out private stable coins. I was wondering if you could kind of flesh out your considerations on that. In particular, I'd be interested to know um, what, val what social value might a private stable coin offer relative to a CBDC? Thanks, Steve. Good to see you. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, in the, in the current environment, uh, stable coins are mostly used by people who want to um, uh, trade one cryptocurrency for another cryptocurrency uh, in or through uh, an intermediary in the crypto world. So the use case right now is, is fairly limited, but uh, private stable coins, as I was mentioning, could be used more broadly for payments. Um, and uh, again, if they do, I think we need to make sure that they are um, strictly regulated at the federal level for uh, prudential purposes. Uh, the central bank digital currency also could be used uh, broadly on the payment system. Um, we currently have forms of central bank digital currency today. Uh, we have reserves at banks, um, uh, for example, that are um, 
uh, you know, really an, a, an essential component of our, of our payment system. Uh, so the question is, what additional value could you get out of a central bank digital currency that we don't have out of our current forms of digital um, currency and, uh, and, and our forms of you know, paper currency, cash? Uh, cash is still quite important for a lot of people. I, I almost never use cash, but uh, as I'm sure many people in the audience don't, but, but for many people, cash is still, still an important medium of exchange and, and likely will be in the future, even if we have a, a freely available retail central bank digital currency. So what could central bank digital currency do? People uh, tend to divide the kinds of activities into, into wholesale and, and retail. On the retail side, uh, the Federal Reserve issued a, a, a study last year that, that basically said, um, uh, if we think it makes sense to do further work on retail, a retail form of central bank digital currency, the form of that would be what's called intermediated uh, retail currency. And by intermediated, it means the central bank wouldn't run around trying to deal directly with households and businesses. Uh, banks or potentially other institutions would be the, as they are today, between the central bank and the users of that uh, retail central bank digital currency. If you, if you go down that road, there are all kinds of questions to ask, like, you know, uh, what are the rules for those intermediaries? You have banks or non-bank participants in it. Uh, uh, how much should you worry about disintermediating of the of the banking system? That is people holding this form of uh, currency instead of using deposits at a bank for their, for their payments activities, what would that mean for the allocation of credit in our society? Uh, so there are all kinds of questions around that. And then uh, there's another set of questions that people raise around uh, privacy. Uh, so, uh, you know, how much information would the central bank or, or other government entities have about the uses uh, would it be um, uh, possible to have, um, you know, strong insulation the way we do now uh, between, um, you know, if the government wants to know something about my bank account, they need to demonstrate that they've met the legal requirements for getting access to that information. So you'd want to have, you know, similar kinds of privacy protections with respect to a, a retail central bank digital currency. You can imagine some people uh, in thinking about that trade-off preferring a stable coin that's privately issued to a central bank digital currency if they're worried about privacy and they don't trust the government um, with respect to the privacy rules that are put in place. So those are the kinds of questions people might ask. And then on the wholesale side, you know, could a, could a form of central bank digital currency help with uh, reducing frictions in cross-border flows, for example, between banks. Um, could it uh, assist with um, uh, uh, improving efficiency and security in uh, foreign currency transactions? Those are the kinds of use cases people think about in the wholesale world. Uh, but we're very, very early in this, Steve, so uh, we're very much in the research and development phase. Uh, we're not looking to uh, win the central bank digital currency arms race. Um, we're really studying it very, very carefully. Um, so, Michael, I would love to follow up, picking up on some of the things that uh, you mentioned, but really going back to your opening story, right? And the college students um, who lost a bundle um, in crypto. And, um, which made me think look, there's a cost to the um, kind of the breadcrumbs approach, right? To the, um, in your speech, you said you can't, you know, regulation needs to be deliberate. It takes time. It responds to real life problems of which we've had plenty, but thank goodness not 0809. Um, but there is a real cost um, to people from lack of regulatory clarity and um, as we know in much clearer terms because of the bigger platforms and louder voices there's a cost to institutions um, so what's your take on the kind of the 
cost of uncertainty and in particular on the incidence right of losses in this space and the disproportionate impact on marginalized and black and brown communities um, uh, in this space uh, it's a, a great question well first of all let me you know be clear that the crypto activity that resulted in these horrible losses was not in the banking system not your fault so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know the banks that we supervise and regulate have pretty uh, limited exposure to crypto related activity. And we're suggesting that they continue to be careful and cautious about those exposures. Uh, even in cases where um, the banks that we supervise have seen these kinds of exposures result to harm to the bank, um, the activity the bank was conducting was traditional banking activity. That is, you know, offering deposits, uh, deposit services. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the approach that we're taking is in the context for banks is in the context of the fact that banks in general are being careful and cautious in this space. And so we're appropriately tailoring our response to the world that we're working in. It doesn't really speak to the question, what's the right role for market regulators with respect to all the activity happening outside of uh, the banking system, where I think we've seen enormous harm. And as you said, um, we don't know that we don't have enough information about the distributional effects, but at least some of the people who are harmed are people who are, you know, like the students who I met who uh, were just looking for a way to, you know, invest in what in, in this new technology. Uh, and, um, you know, we always have this uh, a trade off with respect to innovative products. So uh, you know, you know, abstracting back away from the, the current you know set of circumstances, we have this this basic trade off. If you step in too early, um, you might cut off innovation in a way that you know is harmful overall to the economy. We need innovation for growth. We need innovation to have a vibrant financial sector to contribute to growth. So you need to intervene in an appropriate way uh, for the stage of development of the thing that you're seeing. And the problem is that regulators are always a little bit behind. We, you know, just as a general matter, we know less about the innovation and the than the people doing it. Uh, and um, and innovation, as I said in, in my speech, has these cycles where, you know, things can be going pretty calmly, and therefore you think you have time to wrap your arms around it, and then they just take off and they move very very quickly, and then they overwhelm individual decision making, they overwhelm risk management functions. They are usually when they're taking off extremely lucrative and they feel safe because everything's going up. Um, and so people get even more excited and you get a frenzy. Uh, and then the cycle turns when you get a sharp break like we saw you know, this, this last year with uh, the collapse of Terra Luna and then FTX and then a, a whole host of other um, uh, entities uh, and and the risks are revealed, but but what we find you know often is, is the case is that like some really basic principles are the same basic principles we've known about all along. So, you know, calling something crypto doesn't make it um, immune from the the laws of nature um, mm -hmm. or or sort of the basic risks that we see in finance. And, and that's why I said a lot of what we said so far is kind of motherhood and apple pie because our basic risk management practices are really useful. And yes, but there's the Dodd-Frank moment issue, right? Which is that uh, assume, and it's real, I have full confidence in your supervisory capacities and, and execution. Um, it's a perimeter drawing and coordination issue, right? The fact that something really bad is happening right outside your door to vulnerable people has got to be somebody's problem. And in a way, that is what Dot Frank tried to address in that context. And it feels like there's demand on all sides for that sort of a holistic take. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I said before, I think it would be useful for Congress to have a, a comprehensive framework here. 
um, you know, for the reasons that you described. But in the absence of that comprehensive framework, it's important for regulators to use our existing authorities, uh, both banking regulators and market regulators, to uh, you know do our best to uh, protect the public and protect the financial system. And as I said, inside the banking system, we have the tools we need to do that. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly enriching and thought-provoking and important. Uh, please join me in thanking Vice Chair Barr for his insights.